<clears throat> well, uh, we begin uh, a whole series. I've, I've got at least 13 different lectures, uh, different collections on the Life Review. And I'm going to start, um, well, let me, let me uh, encompass this thought. All people did not have a life review. I, th I think if I remember right, it was about 30 to 35 percent in one of the books that I read uh, a couple years ago. So the majority of people do not have a life review, or at least they did not share it or mention it in their interviews. And those who did have life reviews, they are of such a wide continuum that uh, that fact and uh, the life review seem to be uh, one of the most significant events in the near-death experience that helped people to redirect their lives in a more positive way. It was a teaching without condemnation experience in almost all cases. One of the ones that impressed me, and actually I'll share with you later, um, it helped me just by reading it uh, make some changes in my own life. So the first book is Saved by the Light by Danian Brinkley. He's now passed away, but he had three near-death experiences and uh, shared two life reviews. The third one, uh, at least, is not mentioned uh, in his third book. He's written three books. So we start here in Saved by the Light, and I am reading on page 12, and the life review goes to page 24, and I'm just going to read verbatim and then paraphrase and uh, move that way because it takes an awful lot of time but you'll get you'll get the sense of his life review and his experience quote this life review was not pleasant from the moment it began until it ended, I was faced with the sickening reality that I had been an unpleasant person, someone who was self-centered and mean. The first thing I saw was my angry childhood. I saw myself torturing other children, stealing their bicycles or making them miserable at school. One of the most vivid scenes was of the time I picked up a child at grade school because picked on because he had a goiter that protruded from, protruded from his neck. The other kids in the class picked on him too, but I was the worst. At the time I thought I was funny, but now as I relived this incident, I found myself in his body, living with the pain that I was causing. This perspective continued through every negative incident in my childhood. A substantial number, to be sure. From 5th grade to 12th grade, I estimate that I had at least 6,000 fist fights. Now, as I reviewed my life in the bosom of the being, of light, I really relived each one of those altercations, but with one major difference. I was the receiver. I wasn't the receiver in the sense that I felt the punches that I had thrown. Rather, I felt the anguish and the humiliation my opponent felt. Many of the people I fought had it, had it coming, but others were innocent victims of my anger. Now I was forced to feel their pain. I also felt the grief I had caused my parents. I had been uncontrollable and proud of it. 
Although they had grounded me and yelled at me, I had let them know my actions that none of their discipline really mattered. Many times they had pleaded with me and many times they had met frustration. I had often bragged to my friends about how I had made my parents feel. How I had hurt my parents. Now in my life review, I felt their psychological pain at having such a bad child. My grade school in South Carolina had a demerit, demerit system. Students who received 15 demerits had their parents called in for a conference, while those who had 30 demerits on their record were suspended. In seventh grade, I had received 154 demerits by the third day of school. I was that kind of student. Now they call students like that hyperactive and do, do something about it. Back then, we were just called bad kids and were thought to be lost causes. Okay, now I'm going to do some summarizing. He talks about being in school and uh, picking on a boy in the fourth grade whose name was Kurt. And uh, Kurt would threaten him, take his lunch money, uh, his lunch. He was always afraid of him. And then one time uh, his father asked him what the matter was, and so his father showed him how to make a blackjack. Took his mother's nylon hose and filled it full of sand, and he's, he used it on Kurt and had no more problems with him. When he was in the fifth grade, he polled all of his friends as to who was the meanest and the toughest kid in the neighborhood, and the guy's name was Butch. So he walks up to Butch's house. Mother answers the door. Is Butch here? Yes, I'll go get him. Butch comes to the door and Danian slugs him in the face and walks away. In the sixth grade, a teacher uh, asked him to stop disrupting the class and he refused. And so the teacher grabbed me by the arm and started, started to haul him off to the principal's office. Well, as they moved out of the classroom, he says, I pulled loose and hit her with an uppercut that knocked her to the ground. And he explains, it wasn't that I didn't mind going to the principal's office. Obviously, I'd been there many times. But it just I didn't want to be dragged there by a teacher, and so he slugged her in the jaw. Uh, another experience. He lives next door to a junior high and he's out of school because of the demerit system. And he's sitting in his backyard which is joined to the backyard of the junior high with a fence. And as he's sitting in the backyard some girls come and start to make fun of him. So he goes in and I quote, I went into the house, got my brother's shotgun and loaded it with rock salt. Then I came back out and shot the girls in the back as they fled screaming. Then they used to have, in, when he was in high school, he was, what, 17 at this time? Uh, or nearly so, yeah, 17. Uh, and they had staged fights, and people would come from 30 miles around from different schools to participate or spectate in these fights. And uh, in these days, segregation in high school was common. And uh, a black boy by the name of Lundy was the champion. And they were at a hamburger stand once, and uh, they made arrangements to meet uh, and duke it out. And so Danian says, I'll be there. But he knew he couldn't beat him in a fair fight. And so as he was walking away, 
he hit Lundy at the side of the head that knocked him a little bit uh, starry-eyed for about 10 minutes. And he says, as I lay there struggling on the ground, as he lay there struggling on the ground, I walked around him and kicked him in the chest a couple of times as hard as I could. And then he says, I won't be able to make it tomorrow, I said, so I thought I would just take care of it today. I knew I couldn't beat him in a fair fight, so I jumped him with his back, was turned. Okay? Now I go back to a quote. Twenty years later, at my high school reunion, a classmate cornered my date to tell her what kind of student I had been. Let me tell you what he was famous for, he said. He would beat your ass, steal your girlfriend, or do both. In retrospect, I couldn't have agreed with him more. By the time I was finished with high school, that is exactly who I was. And by the time I had reached that point in my review, I was ashamed of myself. Now I knew the pain I had caused everyone in my life. As my body lay dead on that stretcher, I was reliving every moment of my life, including my emotions, my attitudes, and my motivations. The depth of emotion I experienced during this life review was astonishing. Not only could I feel the way both I and the other person had felt when an incident took place, I could also feel the feelings of the next person that they reacted to. I was in a chain reaction of emotion, one that showed how deeply we affect one another. Luckily, not all of that was bad. And then he talks about driving down the road with his uncle and they see this man beating a goat and he jumps out of the car and starts to beat on the man and uh, helps the goat get out of the fence. He, he talks about animals and I, I think I want to include this though I don't have it marked. But I wasn't always kind to animals. I saw myself whipping a dog with a belt. I had caught this dog chewing on our living room carpet and lost my temper. I had pulled my belt off and let him have it without trying a lesser form of discipline. Later, as I thought about these experiences, I realized that people who beat animals or are cruel to them are going to know how those animals felt when they have a life review. I also discovered that it is not so much what you do that counts, but why you do it. And you see both of these in, in the, the life review. To, relie to relive hurting someone just for fun is the greatest pain of all. To relive hurting someone for a cause you believe in is not as painful. This is in the life review. This became obvious to me when my review took me back through my years in military and intelligence work. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase again. He becomes a sniper in the Vietnam War and belongs to a team. And their specific assignment is to get behind enemy lines and to kill the leaders. Preferably while they're standing out in front of their troops. And so that's what he did during the Vietnam War. Well, one experience, he's in Cambodia. The uh, leader, and I don't know what his position was, the colonel, was out in front of his troops and he shot him uh, as a sniper from some distance away, of course. And uh, he says, I squeezed off the round and felt the rifle kick. A moment later, I saw his head explode and his body crumpled before the shocked troops. This is what I saw when the incident happened, again in life review. Back to quote, During my life review, I experienced this incident from the perspective 
of the North Vietnamese colonel. I didn't feel the pain that he must have felt. Instead, I felt his confusion at having his head blown off and sadness as he left his body and realized that he would never go home again. Then I felt the rest of the chain reaction, the sad feelings of his family when they realized they would be without their provider. I relived all of my kills in just this fashion, and he said somewhere in here that he had dozens and dozens of these type of experience. I saw myself make the kill, and then I felt its horrible results. When in Southeast Asia, I had seen women and children murdered, entire villages destroyed, for no reason or for the wrong reasons. I had not been involved in these killings, but now I had to experience them again from the point of view not of the executioner, executor, but the executed. On one occasion, for example, they were sent into Vietnam or a country adjacent to Vietnam to do the same thing. And they're in the jungle for four days and he, is his, he and his team are getting a little bit frustrated because they can't get a clear shot on this uh, military leader because he's always being guarded. And so this is what they decide to do. Uh, if we can't get a shot at him, let's just go blow up the hotel that he's staying in. That is exactly what we did. We surrounded the hotel with plastic explosives and leveled it at sunrise, killing the officer along with about 50 people who were staying at the hotel. At the time I laughed about it and told my control officer that all the people deserved to die because they were guilty by association. I saw this incident again during my near-death experience, his life review, but this time I was hit by a rush of emotions and information. I felt the stark horror that all of those people felt as they realized their lives were being snuffed out. I experienced the pain their families felt when they discovered that they had lost loved ones in such a tragic way. In many cases, I even felt the loss their absence would make to future generations. That, to me, is profound. All in all, I contributed to the death of dozens of people in Southeast Asia, and reliving them was hard to take. The one saving grace was that at the time I thought what I was doing was right. I was killing in the name of patriotism, which took the edge off the horrors I had committed. When I returned to the United States after, uh, I'm going to paraphrase here a bit, he comes back to the United States, works for the government, and uh, what he does is he ships uh, weapons by airplane into Central America. Now in the life review, I was forced to see the death and destruction that had taken place in the world as a result of my actions. We are all a link in the great chain of humanity said the being. What you do has an effect on the other links in that chain. Quote, he would fly into a, a, a landing strip, unload the weapons, and then he would leave. Life Review showed something different. But leaving wasn't so easy in my life review. I stayed with the weapons and watched as they were distributed at a military staging area. Then I went with the guns as they were used in the job of killing. 
some of them murdering innocent people, and some, the not so innocent. All in all, it was horrible to witness the results of my role in this war. This weapons transfer in Central America was the last job I was involved in before being struck by lightning. I remember watching children cry because they had been told that their fathers were dead, and I knew these deaths were caused by the guns that I had delivered. Then that was it. The life review was over. It's his second book, um, At Peace in the Light, again by Danian Brinkley, and he has a couple of uh, quotes in here about the Life Review that I wish to share. The Life Review, I'm on page 7, the Life Review portion of the near-death, uh, I need to make this uh, comment, when people first tell their near-death experiences, they don't always come forward with everything that happened. They hold back. And as time goes on, their views of what happened in the life, rev or life review change a little bit, and they tweak, or they add, or they take away, or they just omit, whatever. And so in volume, the second volume and the third one, we'll, we'll see that uh, happen. The life review portion of the near-death experience is, I believe, the greatest agent for change. At some points, the reflections from this view are quite painful. For example, when I was in elementary school, I sneaked up behind one of my classmates and pulled the rug he was standing on out from underneath his feet. The move took him completely by surprise, and he slammed his face against the concrete. When he rolled over and sat up, he was bleeding from the mouth on the ground, where he had landed were his two front teeth. There was no pain in his face as he gazed at me, just a look of dazed astonishment as he wondered what had happened. I saw the boy's face again in my life review, along with the entire incident. This time, however, I experienced from his side as well. I felt the painful surprise of being slammed to the ground, with no warning, and even looked back at the boy as the boy did to see my grinning face. I could also tell in this life review why he didn't yell or cry after that happened. The wind had been knocked out of him by the impact. There was no air left in him to have any kind of response come out of his mouth. In another reflection, stemming from his life review, I witness, witnessed myself taunting a little girl, one of my classmates, as she walked to school. I could feel the power in my actions as I frightened the girl by threatening to hit her with a stick. At the same time, though, I could feel her fear. I tried to stop myself in the life review event that I was observing but of course I was unable to do that. This was a life review and the event I was reviewing had actually happened and could not be changed, only reflected upon. My life review did not consist entirely of painful reminiscences. Some of them were ple pleasant to relive and taught me that in the end, love is the most important thing there is. Um, well, I, I won't put words in his mouth. Well, I have, but uh, 
In one astounding scene, I saw myself talking to a man at my father's store. I barely knew this person, but I could tell that he was deeply angry about something that had happened. What's wrong? I asked him. He began telling me about his teenage son and how the boy did not seem to care about anything. He won't do his homework, and all he does when he is around me is try to start fights. It's just hormones, I said. Tell him you love him, and then leave him alone. He needs to feel wanted, but he feels crowded at the same time. The man did what he had talked about, and before long his relationship with his son was better. Although this seemed like an insignificant event, I was able to see the chain reaction of change that can take place from an encounter, great or small. Then he goes on to talk about the whippings that he got from his mother. Now I'll read just two paragraphs. Another portion of my life review came to mind that showed me how love can come in many forms. I had lied to my mother about something and I could feel the sharp sting of the belt that she brought down on my rear end as she impressed upon me the importance of telling her the truth. The whipping hurt me both physically and emotionally. The amazing thing, however, was how much it hurt my mother. In my life review, I could feel the pain she felt as she spanked me. I could also tell that she was spanking me out of love so that I would grow up to become a better person. One other comment, and this is on, oh, that, that quote was on page uh, 8, 9, and 10. This next one is on page 118. Just a couple paragraphs. The panoramic life review is more than just your own home movie. A person who has such a life review is feeling what he meant to people and how he influenced events. A person not only sees what he has done to another person, for instance, but also knows firsthand how that person felt. A whole chain reaction of feeling may be experienced as well as an awareness of how their reaction to a person affects that person's reaction to others, and so on. It is the life review that has the greatest effect on people who have had near-death experiences. Although passing up a tunnel, seeing dead relatives, and being bathed in a mystical light all have a great effect, the panoramic life review instills in people a sense of who they are and how they fit in. The life review will let us see everything we have done and become everyone we have ever met. It also gives us a true understanding of justice and equality. During the experience, you become the judge and jury over events in your life. And a couple here. Secrets of the Light. Again, by Danian Brinkley. When the ambulance screeched to a halt at the hospital doors, several people came running out to meet, meet it. Sandy, that's his wife, and Tommy, that's his friend, were escorted to a rating, waiting room, and my body was speedily wheeled into the emergency room, just in time to be pronounced D-O-A, dead on arrival. It was a hectic Friday night at the hospital since the severe thunderstorm had wreaked havoc on the town. The examining room I occupied was needed for living patients, 
So my body was covered with the sheet and stored in an empty room until an orderly could be found to take me to the morgue. This definitely was not turning out to be my lucky day. But I wasn't there for any of that. Instead of going into the emergency room with the gurney, I found myself enveloped by the shimmering blue-gray vastness of a whirling tunnel. Next I was transported through space. Feet first, as though I was lying on an invisible conveyor belt. Initially all I expect, experienced was deep silence, but soon I could detect the faint sound of chimes carried on the wind from a distance. Ever so gently I felt my body vibrating in response to each tinkling tone. Still the spiraling space continued to rhythmically coil round and round me. At this point I saw a light at what appeared to be the end of this swirling vortex. The light emanated at an incredibly brilliant and captivating glow. At first I was afraid to look at it. I thought it would burn my eyes. Yet I could not help myself. I felt irresistibly drawn to gaze into it. Surrounding to, surrendering to the temptation, I suddenly found myself standing inside the light. In fact, the light and I were one. I felt safe and complete, perhaps for the first time in my life. The light was alive. It infused me with its warmth and cradled me in what I sensed to be a sanctuary of all-consuming love and acceptance. The experience was beyond exhilarating. Now I proceeded to comment on the life review of this quote because he's now become one with the light. Uh, and other people don't necessarily say that. There are people there observing, or beings rather. So, now we, we uh, get to the life review. Instead, the being promptly proceeded to turn my attention in the direction of other souls, which I hadn't realized were moving all around me. As they focused on them, I could discern that they were occupying different levels of energy and vibration. Those who appeared to exist below me were vibrating at a much lower rate, and focused on them caused my vibration to slow uncomfortably. Those above me were lighter in density and emitted a higher frequency than my own. Yet by looking on them I began to increase my own vibrations. That just fascinates me. I've got about 40 quotes on vibrations and that'll be some lectures down the road. Or up the road rather. Okay. He begins now to focus uh, with the help of the light. As I did, the being scooped me up in what felt like a huge embrace, one that launched me on the journey of my lifetime. This fantastic voyage blasted me into my past, beginning with the day I was born. From that point forward, I was shown the highlights from every year of my life, right up to the moment the lightning fried my body and claimed my soul. I have since coined a phrase to describe this comprehensive afterlife spectacle. I call it the panoramic life review. Why? Because I saw my life in 360 degree panorama. And it was skillfully produced and directed to remind me of my first 25 years of less than righteous behavior. No kidding. I was mortified as I watched the movie of my life unfold. I had hurt so many people and acted out in so many cruel and ugly ways. 
from the kids I teased in the schoolyard to the enemies whose lives I had targeted for my country. I had lived a life that was harsh and violent. To this very day, I consider my panoramic life review to be the pinnacle point of my time spent in heaven. By the time my life review ended, I was aware of another vitally important fact. The universe is systematically designed to assist us in the fulfillment of our personal desires. However, there is a hook, and a sizable one at that. You see, within the system of universal consciousness, no mechanism exists for the discernment of what we call right and wrong, or any sinful act. Simply put, the universe does not recognize the difference between light and dark or good and evil. Therefore, we must. It is up to us, for within us resides this innate knowing. We have come to this earth for the express purpose of learning to master the proper execution of our pre-existing spiritual wisdom. I've got several lectures on the pre-existence and what happened there from near-death experience point of view. We will act as our own judge and jury. Take it from me. This is a far more eye-opening point of view than any religious perspective we might now maintain. And in the end, we alone will hold ourselves accountable for our every thought, work, and deed as well as the resulting ramification in the lives of those we touch. So you can begin to see why the life review is such a significant event or part of people's near-death experiences. Uh, now he goes on, how much do I want to do here? He goes on and uh, I'll read just a uh, few paragraphs. His second <clears throat> out of body, his second near death. The instant the tip of that surgical saw touched my chest, I catapulted out of my body. I rolled over in spirit to see myself lying on the operating table. I watched as the doctor skillfully wielded his scalpel through my skin and sawed open my sternum with his high-speed electrical tool. He slowly turned the wheels on the device that spread my chest wide open. I witnessed him taking my heart out of my chest cavity and placing it on a square silver plate. My heart continued to pump for another several seven beats or so, and then it abruptly halted. I was dead again. It impressed me that no one in the operating room thought much of what was happening to my body. The other attending physicians were engrossed in a lively conversation about their upcoming fishing trip and didn't appear to regard my body as a physical presence in the room. At this point, it all was becoming too much for me. I heard the familiar sound of distant chimes. I found myself being transported through the tunnel and moving toward the shimmering brilliance of the comforting and brilliant and beautiful life. My second near-death experience was poised to commence, and I was looking forward to it. My second celestial experience was basically the same as the first time around. Just like the first time, not a single soul came to meet me in the vestibule of paradise. Not Satan, not my mama, not even one furry critter I had ever owned 
took the opportunity to welcome my arrival. I guess that gives you a pretty good idea of the general effect I had on people and pets through the years. However, the magnificence of the being of light, the same tour guide that I had had in 1975, who took me through my subsequent panoramic life review, was undiminished in his brilliance. After the life review was complete, one very different thing did indeed occur. An extraordinary sense of pride and accomplishment flooded through me. I certainly didn't, hadn't had that experience the first time. In the 14-year interval between near-death experiences, I had worked hard to change my ways. Now I was shown that I had been triumphant. I witnessed a considerable difference in my behavior. I was more compassionate and far more thoughtful than the person I had watched in my earlier life review. In this new version, I was impressed with the way I automatically reacted to the, to the world around me. In the old days, everything had been a calculated response. This new picture expressed a conscious, gentle, and deeply tender essence. And that, to me, uh, the whole book is uh, uh, it's very deep, good. That, to me, is the significance of the life review. And I've gone over time again. I have a clock here and I don't even look at it. Okay. Uh, a personal note. After reading a dozen or so of these, and we've still got a lot more to go, I began to evaluate my own life and all the fights that I had been in, and the arguments, and the contentions, etc., etc., etc. And for months, I made it a point in my personal prayers in the evening, before I retired, to ask Heavenly Father to bring back to my memory those things that I had done that I could still repent of, and receive forgiveness. And he goes on, Danny and Brinkley goes on and talks about forgiveness, and maybe we'll get there sometime. But I systematically, first of all, I, the things that I remembered, the encounters that I had had in arguments, etc. And then, honestly, Heavenly Father, through the Spirit of the Holy Ghost, began to reveal to my mind things that I had long forgotten. And uh, in one of my lectures, a woman asked me, well, Les, uh, has reading all these stories made any difference in your own life? And I just got very emotional and I said, absolutely. Why should I have to wait to have an embarrassing life review when I can eliminate a lot of those things, and the scriptures say that God will remember them no more. And they won't be held against us in our life reviews when we truly pass from this life into the next one. And so it's had a profound effect on me. And so this is the... Uh, End of life review number one.
Mata. Oh, shut this off. 